Ja, vielen Dank. Schön, dass Sie noch hier sind, wieder hier sind zum zweiten Teil der Konferenz zur Zeitenwende. Das erste Panel beschäftigt sich mit dem Aus, den Auswirkungen des Krieges gegen die Ukraine auf die internationalen Arbeitsbeziehungen. Wir werden es in Englisch führen, so wie vorhin schon das Gespräch mit Jal Rohn, ähm, genau, weil unsere drei Gäste, genau wie wir, Englisch nicht als Muttersprache haben und wir sozusagen einen Common Ground haben durch die Sprache. Yes, if As we said in the morning, uh, when we started to make plans for this conference, uh, Theater and Nets, in 2022, uh, there was a great enthusiasm. Uh, we thought, okay, it could be a conference post-pandemic, post-corona. We wanted to investigate how theater can reach its audience newly. Um, our mood was optimistic. And then came the 24th of February and Russia's attack on Ukraine And this meant a profound change, because after Corona now means in the middle of the war in Europe. And we thought we have to address this change and what it means for the working conditions in the cultural field and in the theatrical field. And we're very glad that three experts have followed our invitation to discuss the situation. They have profound experience with international work They're experts on Eastern European cultural landscape. We welcome in the middle Anastasia Kosudi. She's a play playwright from Ukraine. Um, she was principal dramaturge of post play theater in Kiev and planned on opening the theater of playwrights uh, there in the mid March, which uh, for obvious reasons didn't uh, pass, didn't come true. Um, due, to due to the war, she had to leave Ukraine and is currently on tour with a series of readings on the war, which will also ha have a station here at Theatertreffen on um, May 14th. It's hello, <laughs> good to have you here. Um, left. <laughs> On her left is Ekaterina Degot. She's an art historian, art critic, and curator who has worked for many institutions, amongst them the Tretyakov Gallery in Moscow and the Academy of the Arts of the World in Köln. Since 2018, she's the artistic director of Steirische Herbst in Graz. <laughs> And there's Stefan Schmidtke. He's a theater maker and theater curator who has worked for numerous theaters as well as festivals, among them Theater der Welt 2020, which he curated. And right now he is a managing director of European Capital of Culture at Chemnitz 2025. And he has studied in Russia and is also a translator of plays from Russian authors. Hello. Since you want to know more about uh, the effects of the war on your working conditions and your work, that would be a question we addressed to all the three of you in the beginning. Anastasia, it's um, quite obvious what happened. So how is your work going these days? Yeah, well, um, hi. <laughs> um, as you said, um, so we started uh, Theatre of Playwrights in Kyiv two years ago as an idea, as a like union for Ukrainian playwrights to defend our rights and uh, make better writing. Then uh, last year we had an unofficial opening of not yet completely renovated theater of playwrights in Kyiv next to Postova Ploscha, and we planned a big, big opening on the 12th of March. Uh, but of course it didn't happen because uh, the war started. Um, yeah, but still I think it was very, very well planned decision uh, to make this collective of the Ukrainian playwrights because now we are still keeping in touch with, with one another and still we are um, doing uh, events together like this uh, series of readings uh, that happened already in Berlin, will happen also uh, during Berliner Verspiele on the 14th of May and uh, yeah, so uh, sometimes the place doesn't matter, connections And internet helps uh, still to do our work. We'll come back to the theater of playwrights in a, in a minute. Ekaterina Degot, what does the 24th of February mean to you in the context of your work? Well, I was actually not even in the middle, maybe at the one of the beginnings of the preparation of the festival. Well, middle, but not the end of it. Yeah. And 
I understood that that was, of course, a shock uh, in many ways, uh, personally, emotionally, but also intellectually. I immediately understood that everything is over. Like all the discourses I was basing, not just my intellectual life, but in general my whole personality on, like, the pride of Soviets defeating Nazism, the, I don't know, the anti-colonial element that was still part of Soviet Union, the tragedy of Holocaust, the discourse of German guilt, the solidarity between the left wing uh, in Russia and Ukraine now. I understood like all of it is over. And some of, some of those things, things got are not over, the solidarity for instance, but the discourses, some of those discourses are just, you know, thrown away and destroyed by Putin's aggression. So that's, one has to start anew thinking of many, many of those things. And I also felt at that moment already, which was a very symbolic moment, of course, because bombing of Kiev is how the World War II started for Soviets. This is how the 22nd of June of 41, the war started. And it became clear in that particular moment that this is a great beginning for Ukraine, I still hope, but it's the end for Russia. So at least for the Russia I know, it will not return. So it has to be something new, it has to be something we will either build or we will endure. So that was this very, very entangled complex of thoughts that I had on that day. Probably the thought of a beginning for the Ukraine does sound very weird at the moment. Um, Stefan Schmidtke, what was it to you, the 24th of February? Uh, from, from, uh, you macht das so, okay. Uh, from the practical side, uh, for me, nothing has changed, as because uh, my job is to provide support, to find artists, to create strengths that they can do their artistic work, and I think there will be nothing changed. This is my job, I have to do this, this is my duty. Um, I can follow very much to um, Yekaterina because uh, 25 years of my professional life I spent in uh, support of an expression uh, or I spent time and resources for artists that they can express themselves, that they can tell us their stories, that they can provide their impressions about contradiction of their life. And I understand uh, there is a huge job which will start now to refigure, to reinstall, and at least uh, to start to create any kind of platform we might will find together again to restart all our thinking. That is what my life has changed. Uh, from the practical side, the European Capital of Culture is a huge developing program which will uh, have at least five years in advance to prepare projects. We started last year to prepare, I mean, it now sounds like a joke, a train of peace from Kharkov to Chemnitz, which should uh, go through all over Europe and visit all these countries, which is impossible now, but possibly maybe the train will go in a different way, but we were still working on this project. So what I hear from the three of you is that um, 24th of February kind of a 9-11 for the arts and culture in Europe? Could one say this, or is this too harsh? We are living in a very privileged country, so there is a lot of things I can do. We're working on a, a, um, a residency program. We are working on structures and things we can provide from a very simple, practical way. Uh, but the way how to restart, to reconnect, how to talk each to other, is this possible? That's a thing I don't know how to start it again. This is a very good occasion here. Thank you very much for this uh, occasion to invite us and to to figure out how it could be possible to reflect on all this disaster around us. Uh, yeah, I, I just thought right now about my conversation with uh, Natalia Vrushbit, great Ukrainian playwright. We met with her on the on the 2nd of March in Lviv uh, because I escaped from Kyiv to Lviv and we traveled for three days and then we met with Natalia 
And uh, we were sitting in the cafe, very surreal situation, because you know all the cafes at the time in Kyiv, for example, and many other cities were closed, but in Lviv still some, you know, uh, some places were working. And we sat, and uh, she told to me, you know, uh, it feels like it's, uh, it's like continuation of stuff that Russia is doing to Ukrainian culture. It's like, again, the shooting resurrection. It's like, again, the 60s when they killed all the best uh, people in art. It's like, again, since 2014 when the war started, uh, Ukrainian culture really blossomed. We had a very, very good theater, very good literature, very good movies. And then now, again, they want to kill it all and uh, to destroy. And I mean, it's true, like just today, I woke up to the news that uh, direct missile uh, destroyed the museum of Horhori Skovoroda in Ukraine. Then before that, the museum of Maria Primachenko was uh, destroyed also in Mariupol. The museum of Kuinji is destroyed and like paintings are stolen to Russia. And um, yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's not a new thing, and this is why I feel very weird when people here say that it's like Putin's war, because it's not. It's it's a continuation of the processes that was there for many, many centuries for Russia, continuously destroying Ukrainian culture and wanted it to be just a province that provides grain and food, and that's it. Um, so, uh, no, it's not 9-11. I think it's like it's something that we thought will happen at some point, and... Everybody in Ukraine, I think now, are um, yeah, very, very angry. And uh, if before that, uh, if before 24th of February, some kind of links were still present, some people were working together, now I think it's destroyed for a very, very long time. May I answer too? Uh, actually, my thoughts um, went in a completely different direction. Um, because uh, when you said 9-11 for culture, and I immediately started thinking, okay, and what were the consequences of 9-11 for culture? And I actually couldn't find any. The only thing I found is actually the increase of racial profiling and the increase of, uh, you know, discriminating people because they look Muslim or something like that. That came to my mind what... This is what is my head actually happened immediately after 9-11. So I really hope that nothing like that would actually happen. This is a question really coming to in the end, I hope, um, with the boycotts against Russian culture. Um, Anastasia, you just mentioned the Ukrainian theater scene. Maybe we have a look at that. Um, what kind of... Um, base does the theater of playwrights have in Kiev? Is it very outstanding? Was it an initiative that's very new or are there roots to this initiative? Yeah, well, just for a little context of Ukrainian theater for the last eight years and a bit before, so um, Ukraine has a big problem uh, with government theater still, um, as I think many Eastern European countries too. Um, we have a very good so-called fringe, uh, in independent uh, culture that is mostly founded by international grants, sometimes in the last few years by uh, Ukrainian government too, through Ukrainian Institute and Ukrainian Cultural Foundation. Uh, but mostly it's, um, it's a very complicated life, let's say, to make a modern Ukrainian culture that is independent. And there are also government ins institutions, government theaters, that are paid by the government and they mostly produce, let's say, like a relic art that it's not completely relevant for today's topics, for today's uh, tools of theater, today's tools of art. Uh, and these two things are completely opposite. They almost never meet. For uh, With few examples, for example, like in, uh, in Lviv, there is a wonderful theater of Les Ukrinki Theater, and it changed completely for the last, I think, six years because um, new managers came to it, just three people, uh, Olha Bozhakovska, Viktoria Shutko, and Oksana Donchuk, uh, and uh, they changed it completely. Like before, it was like falling apart, old building, and now there are international collaborations, like people coming, people doing stuff. Yeah, so, and, uh, but 2014, I think, gave us a huge push and um, I think these events will make it even more strong, despite the, uh, the, the, the yeah, obvious things that are happening. Because um, 
it gave so much strength of uh, so much strength to the artist, and uh, yeah, because uh, now you understand that you have to talk about events that are happening in, in the country and also a lot of independent uh, international uh, interest in us. Um, and yeah, I think um, Ukrainian theatre will change very much. We do not know how yet, uh, because for now we are just doing a culture for expert for Europe. Um, but we'll see. Yeah, uh, one question to your network. You, you said you could maintain the network of playwrights um, abroad. Um, in your writing right now, do you primarily, pri primarily address uh, German audiences, for instance, you being here in Germany, in order to inform about uh, what's going on in Ukraine, or do you still have Ukraine audiences in mind? I mean, yeah, uh, about the theater of playwrights, there are 20 of us, so of course some of us are still in Ukraine. For example, the head of the theater, Maxim Kurishkin, he is uh, in the territorial defense in Ukraine with a gun, sending photos, looking very differently now. Um, and uh, there are like uh, other playwrights who are in Europe in different cities and different countries. Um, I think I'm still writing for Ukraine, but um, now it's easier to present this writing for the German audience because before that, when I was doing project with Gorky Theater in 2017, it was hell writing for the German audience because uh, no, because they uh, I understood that people do not know close like they know close to nothing about Ukraine, and if you yeah. And um, I wanted to write about the war, of course, uh, but then I understood that people do not know where Crimea is and cannot tell the difference between Crimea and Donetsk and Luhansk. And I thought, well, okay, this is very bad. How can I? <laughs> I don't want to make it like a historical lecture, of course, uh, because also nobody would be interested in that. And uh, then I chose like this sci-fi frame for it, like uh, Doctor Who-ish stuff. Uh, but this text also was not popular in Germany. It was good for Ukrainian audience. Now, people think that they know stuff about Ukraine, sometimes in a very naive way, uh, but still it's much easier and also the interest is much greater. So I think it's a good time to present our texts in Europe and also uh, for Europe to finally understand that we are not one uh, scene with a uh, Russian scene that Ukrainian playwright in Ukrainian theater has completely different uh, artistic values. Um, yeah, so this is what we are doing now. What are those values or some of them? You mentioned that separate you from Russian art. Well, I mean, um, even if you look, for example, hmm? yeah, yeah, kind of, yeah. But even if you come to the how the texts are written, um, if you look at the um, at the topics, at how people are speaking about political topics in their place, if you look, for example, for the um, uh, people for the text chosen for Lubimovka Festival this year, uh, last year it's not chosen yet, and if you look at uh, Ukrainian festivals and just compare it, it's it's very very big change. And uh, the ability to talk freely about things that matter to you now and non not ability to do that, I think it affects uh, in a very big way um, everything. Yeah. It's true, we could talk about this for a long time. Let's get back to maybe the effects on the working um, work life or the professional programming mistake. Got. Um, your program is in the making. Yes, you told us. And in the last years, you are a visual arts curator. So Sayosha Herbst uh, changed from a more theater festival to a more visual arts festival with exhibitions and um, performances on site. Um, you also chose always very strong motti or topics for your festivals. In 2018, it was Volksfronten, like Popular Front. Then it was Grand Hotel Abyss in 2019 and Paranoia TV in 2020, as well as The Way Out in 2021. So what's your m topic or motto of this year's festival? Um, actually, it's not completely true that we are visual arts and exhibitions. We are trying to be in interdisciplinary, doing different things. But this year it is true that as an exception, uh, I'm having a big exhibition 
um, in Neugaler in Graz, and before that, the first chapter or the prologue to it already in summer with videos and films by Ukrainian artists. But the thing is, the title of it was about it, I decided about it already last year. And the title is Ein Krieg in der Ferne, A War in a Distance. Because I was going through uh, paintings of Neue Galerie, which is an old museum, has all sorts of stuff, 19th century, nobody was interested in that, not major names. And I was just looking what is there. And there are lots of paintings that implying that there is a war somewhere nearby. There are recruiters coming and going. Uh, there are some still lives of... Um, uh, you know, metallic objects that in 1916 are supposed to be given to, um, how to say, to transform them into, you know, uh, um, uh, lands, yeah, whatever. Uh, look, like other things, there is a landscape with refugees. The refugees are barely seen in 45. Uh, there is lots of things that imply that there is somewhere, there is this sound. Even the poem, Steirish Herbst is named after a poem of 1919, and the poem is like of a famous local poet, like I'm sitting in a nice garden and I'm listening to the sounds of a battle of Isonzo. I don't know if anybody knows what battle of Isonzo is. I didn't. And it's actually one of the major battles of World War I that was happening in Slovenia, what is now Slovenia, but used to be Italy at that moment. And it's really around the corner from Graz. And there is always something around the corner. So that will be about that. So that will be, except for this summer project, which we are doing specifically to show incredibly good and strong films of Ukrainian filmmakers and video makers done even before the war. In the last 10 years, I would say, although also there are also some historical moments. The show itself is not about the war in Ukraine. It's about all those wars, but the spirit is, of course, very much stimulated by what is going on now. Did your thoughts about this topic change? Like, um, would you like to name it now a war next to us? or No. no? Not at all, because this is not about the war, it's about the indifference to the war. It's about that. It's about that people are drinking their tea in the nice garden and listening to the Battle of Isonzo going on. So that's, that's rather about that. And this is also, it, it's not a very direct show, it's a very subjective show. Uh, it's about also some of the things that are kind of bringing war to us, which is colonialism or class conflicts or different different things. So it's a, it's a rereading of the collection, but this is just one part of the festival. There are also performances and theater pieces and conversations and an exhibition of uh, Harun Faruqi films. Uh, so there are different things that are from different sides uh, coming to, to this moment where uh, the war is becoming a reality for us now. Like Baudrillard was telling us the war is not real, right? So this is where we actually used to think, oh, okay, that's what we know from postmodern times, that it's all on TV. But now we see that it's not just that. Also, I'm, I'm working with 19th century paintings, and I see that the Putin's war, this Russian war in Ukraine, is so surprisingly 19th century. So it's not even this Gerasimov doctrine, as his main general actually developed, that the war is mostly done, contemporary war is mostly done in soft way, by you know weakening your adversary economically, which actually happened right before February. This is why nobody thought that there will be war, because Putin was already actually achieving his goals. Grivna was down, economy was down of Ukraine. So everybody thought, oh, okay, this is what he wants. But this is, was not what he wants. So he's, it's actually the... The war is very much, it's very archaic. It's not that war which we know from, you know, from other contexts recently where people are, uh, you know, on the beach and there is a war like in two kilometers from there. So this is not that war. So it's, it's, it's very archaic. We're coming to Stefan Schmidtke in a moment, but Anastasia Kosodi, do you have any remarks on this? Like, uh, is it a war in the distance? How does it feel for you, this um, European shift of territories and... To be honest, it doesn't feel for me as a war in the distance because I remember when I came to uh, to Germany after going out of Ukraine and I came to Munich and it was uh, early March and we did an interview with a journalist from BBC and he told me that before making these interviews they 
uh, like asked people on the streets what they're thinking about the war, and he said that a lot of people were very scared, actually, uh, very scared that the missiles can actually not get actually cross the border of Ukraine and uh, appear in their own uh, streets. And I think it's a very um, realistic fear because this can happen. And um, I'm not angry, uh, you know, with um, with European society enjoying nice things while still knowing about the war, because I think this is what um, all Ukrainians understood after the 24th of February, is that um, one of the main things about the war is that you have to still manage to enjoy your life, uh, because, well, A, it can end any moment, and also we cannot let uh, Russians take from us uh, all the joy of our life all good things that we have in our life, we still have to enjoy it as much as we can and do nice things and, uh, yeah, and leave. And, yeah, honestly, I do not agree with you what you said about Ukrainian economy and Grivna being down. It wasn't true. It wasn't like that. Actually, Ukrainian uh, economy was good uh, and lots of good stuff was happening. Like, by every Ukrainian now coming, for example, to Germany is very surprised about the level of the digitalization because... A lot of things were, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So I mean the low level of the digitalization. In yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, like digital government and so on, so on. Um, so yeah. Stefan Schmidtke, um, the motto of uh, European culture, of capital of culture, uh, Chemnitz 2025, is uh, make see the unseen. Uh, and of course, that in the first place refers to uh, the people in Chemnitz. It's, it's designed as a kind of bottom-up festival where people should, in workshops, bring up ideas, bring up projects. You want to involve the inhabitants of Chemnitz, of course. But then again, Chemnitz also, as a cultural capital, should have a European appeal. Uh, in what respect do you think this war, which, as we all agree, has been in a way unseen because it started in 2014. Uh, in what respect could that become part of this make, see the unseen? What a question. Uh, uh, to understand that our Western European construction uh, to feel well in this Europe and what we haven't seen, the reality in Russia, is what makes us waking up now. Uh, everything was there, and everything was planned, and everything was prepared. And the German federal parliament was attacked years ago by hackers. And this is a very long-term asymmetric process of influencing Western European media, Western European parties, and whatever, and whatever. It was just in a certain miraculous way ignored. And it was just not accepted or realized that there is a country preparing, and as it was really told, a very archaic return of European power of the last century, which is the major plan of this thing. You might uh, can think this. Um, I have to make some swaps and steps and, cris and crosses because see the unseen means Chemnitz as a eastern city in a western European country, which is quite an interesting subject as because the construction of this program European Capitals of Culture is always having one city from old western Europe and one city from new Europe. And our partner city is Nova Gorica in former Yugoslavia. So this construction is as crazy as you can do it because we are East and now old, and they've been always part of an uh, independent and block independent system, and they had strong ties and connections to the West, not only economically, but in the arts and in the philosophy and whatever. So that, that's one difficult part we have to figure out as we are uh, forced now with the situation we are in uh, to refigure the whole, um, it's very difficult to describe, the, the main topic of this capital of culture is it to find an expression, 
about this completely restructured industrial city from the last century. Chemnitz was one of the richest cities in Europe. They created machinery. This was 350,000 people. They went through communism and they're now ending up as the city with the eldest population in Europe lost 100,000 people. So I have to start and to discuss a very specific Chemnitz and German subjects. And out of this, I have to create partnerships with the countries around to come to a major and wider perspective of what the hell this Europe of coming could be. And we are facing in this run, and now it's coming very complicated, uh, many problems of uh, our European construction on the level on constitution, on nationalism and all these things, which we have to implement at least in frames of dialogue or on platforms we might can meet. What I think other institutions or other uh, yeah, European institutions are not provide at the moment. So we have to be very creative in a certain way to create platforms of meeting and exchange that are not existing yet. So we have to make the impossible possible. And we have five years for doing this. And I can remain only on this abstract level now because we have to work with connections, with partnerships. We have to create these connections. And it is, in the end, to create such a project, not just art, it's very real social work, cultural work, sport. A capital of culture doesn't mean a festival or an arts event. We are a developing strength for children, youth, senators, uh, for uh, sports, for all major uh, things that are belonging to culture, food, architecture, and there would be a, an advantage to create a workshop with a wider sense on reflecting on the Europe to come, looking on this disaster we have in front now. This is the only thing I can tell in May 22, having a look on 25. What changes did you have to make to your program so far? I mean, um, you're telling about you can't tell so much, but is, are the things, I mean, we talked about the European peace train that doesn't work out, that had to start from Kharkiv. Maybe you can okay. say a bit more about I, that. Yeah, okay, five minutes about capital of culture. Uh, make it I, two, I, please. Okay, <laughs> I have to explain it because many people don't understand this. The programming which is there was prepared four years, uh, in a four years term ago. So the program which is existing now is end of a long process of workshopping city reflections on this. You have a bit book like yeah, a we have schedule a bit book. you have the to bit fulfill. The book was uh, predicated with European capital, with the title European capital of culture. So now we're coming for the very first time into the situation that not a pandemic is changing the situation, what it is, but a real political and a real geographical uh, process. And so we are forced to re-workshop everything, and I have to start a huge deal with the EU Commission and to make clear, this bit book is from yesterday, we have to renew everything, which is quite forcing, because this is a, a city open wide process. And what I'm now trying to propose to the um, supporters of us is we would like to implement in this refiguring of the process international partners they are not there yet. You're very right. It's special. Thank you for this. <laughs> it's not a festival. <laughs> no, it is not. <laughs> Obviously you know, not. Most of the people think, <laughs> ah, you have 60 million euro and you make a ni nice festival. No, no, we are developing institutions. We are running capacity building with networking. We are sending these regional players to Switzerland, to festivals. We are connecting them to uh, political organizations. This is a very, very much different process. And so I think the Heinrich Böll Stiftung knows how to do this. <laughs> this is the way how they work. To refrain it, um, could you use those means? I mean, you said 60 millions before you said 90 millions. It's a lot of money. Can you use we those means? We have 90 to millions and we have to invest 30 millions in structures and 60 millions is for programming. Yeah, uh, maybe coming back from the It's a very strange thing, I know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> from the infrastructural <laughs> question, maybe um, coming back to the question of uh, the production of arts. Um, 
Mais que sur YouTube. Sorry, I, in, in this way, I have to interrupt you. Because <laughs> if you want to produce art, you need the machinery for doing it. And this country is just disastrous destroyed. So I think what we have to understand is in which way we can collaborate and we can support. And what are the, ang I mean, performing arts is a very difficult thing. You need spaces, you need collectives, you need, you need s all these things. And we have to create partnerships on that level that enables our friends and artists to do their work on a very simple daily basis. So I hear from this that you are focusing on Ukraine in a way and looking for means to build up the infrastructure there through partnerships. That's correct? This is how to make a bicycle in the full run into an yes. airplane. Mm. So. Yeah, I just need to add to what you said that actually art is being made now in Ukraine uh, despite the war. And for example, again, in Les Ukraine Theater, there was a premiere of play called The First Day of War. Play premiered in the basement of the theater, of course, and it's documentary play based on the stories, women's stories, um, about the first day of war. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, again, despite all the all the uh, everything that is happening now, Ukrainian culture is uh, actually blooming, but just not blooming in Ukraine, because every day there are some readings of Ukrainian texts in various uh, cities and various countries. Um, But of course, a lot of artists are struggling because, uh, yeah, it's very, it's funnily enough, in the whole Ukrainian culture, the best uh, situation is now for playwrights, playwrights, because we just can sit, you know, and write. Uh, and uh, it's much more complicated for actors and for directors because, again, yes, they need spaces and they need language and they need opportunities. And it's a big question how then we plan to do art together. Uh, because we talked about you, with you about that previously, that um, my wish is that somehow we can do it together and not just implement Ukrainian art in like big scheme, for example, of some big event, but discuss together before um, before making it, before planning the festival, how we can do it best, uh, because then we can. Um, Uh, then we can uh, not have uh, such a disastrous things as uh, happened, well, not in art, but for example, what happened in the Catholic Easter in um, uh, Vatican, where they put together Russian and Ukrainian women, which is completely mad, disgraceful thing for all Ukrainians. Um, but they did it with good heart. No, they just wanted to uh, to make a nice image but with complete lack of knowledge uh, and complete lack of talking with any Ukrainian person, I'm sure. So, yeah. So what would it be that festivals or cultural capitals could do to um, promote Ukrainian art and maybe help to build it up again after the war? Do you have any ideas in your collective? Are there plans? Well, I think the good example of that is uh, the event that will be happening on the 14th of May of uh, Theater Treffen Berliner Verspiele, because they came to me beforehand and said, like, hey, we want to make a Ukrainian event, but uh, and we have some fundings, but what is the best way to do it? Let's get discuss. And it's actually a very easy and beautiful way to do it, because then uh, we can talk together and understand uh, what, what we can create out of it. Um, The good thing is that Ukraine had uh, connections with various uh, German and not only German institutions before the big Russian uh, uh, yeah, stuff. Uh, so uh, still, like for example, with Münster Kammerspiele, uh, we have already some uh, co-productions that will be uh, developed uh, soon. And uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, Should we have a look at this topic of post-colonialism, or rather colonialism, at this moment? Miss um, Degot, you left Russia 10 years ago after the annexation of Crimea. And um, as you said in a recent interview with Süddeutsche Zeitung, Russia was becoming an anti-Western obscurantist and xenophobic state. Could you say a few more words about what you meant or mean? I mean, we, we talked about this. Um, The invasion and stuff. Well, it's a huge topic, but um, I expect uh, that anyone who has heard anything about Russia recently knows that that uh, that there is a 
Well, the politics of the state is uh, becoming completely unbearable uh, f for any you know, cultural producer right now. It's not just so it started uh, with the law against so-called LGBT propaganda, uh, which basically was uh, you know, making impossible um, many, many things. And still now the censorship is uh, very strong on that, but that was just the beginning. Uh, then, like, uh, t t in a nutshell, right now, there is a law. Uh, that what was very important and was went completely unnoticed in the West was the law against educational initiatives. Well, I, I must say, I also wrote about it. So my, my main view about this country, Russia, was about how things got inefficient it is. Actually, there were many very bad in political initiatives, but it was never, like, 100% efficient. You could always find some sort of niche for you to survive as a kind of dissident or semi-dissident cultural producer, but it's not the case anymore. I don't know who is behind it, like Mr. Putin himself, or but they're really looking very closely how this dissident thinking or even independent thinking or even like free thinking is actually produced. This is why several years ago, educational initiatives were blocked or criminalized. Uh, and this is not just about art, you know, in our context in Russia, and I still say our, even if I don't work there for 10, and don't live there for 10 years, but I still kind of feel very much for those, you know, independent artists or dissident artists that are still there, and whose position is very, very fragile. Uh, so that's... Um, Everything is made to, to make their life either impossible or to silence them or to make them, you know, like just compatible with the system, doing something which is, does not raise any questions. And unfortunately, some people will have uh, to uh, go this way. And of course, you know the law against foreign agents, so called foreign agents, which comes to anybody who's getting support, like grant support, for instance, from the West. And right now, it's the, the, the latest uh, correction to this law. It's not just about material support, it's about when you sympathize with the West, that's it. And then you are a foreign agent, and your family is also foreign agents too. You know, that's just how it is now. Uh, and of course, this is not criminal yet, but from this position, so you have to declare yourself as a, as a foreign agent, and then like n other steps, if you say war against, uh, in, instead of special operations, this is already, you know, distributing fake news. So I, I think you know all of it. So that is the situation which is happening in Russia now. Yeah, let's call it obscurantism, let's call it patriarchality, let's call it like, let's call it total catastrophe of intellectual and artistic life. So a lot of dissidents are leaving the country. Would you say that a lockdown against Russian art, which is kind of close to the state, if it's financed or if it's coming as kind of an export from the country, should be banned for a while? What, what's your position on this question of boycott, Ms. Degot? Oh, it's a long conversation. Um, Maybe we make I'm it not, short. I'm not a big fan of the word boycott, because boycott is mostly about proclaiming something and usually um, there is some idea behind it, you know, to, to bring attention to the one who is saying something, who's boycotting. I'm more about, like, gesture of... Uh, well, I, when someone cannot do something because he or she feels that it's just not possible anymore. And there are many things, this is how I started our conversation, there are many things that are just not possible. For me as a curator, there is not possible for me to participate, let's say, if I would have been invited now to Moscow with a lecture, I would not do it, probably. Although, you know, I, I cannot say, because there are some educational contexts where I, I think one has to feel what brings something good and what doesn't. And for that, one must know things. And here, I completely agree with my colleague that people in the West just don't know enough about Ukraine, about Russia as well, how things are actually working there. Uh, what are those societies, what are those, you know, cis political systems, what is the history of those countries and, and, and those people. So that's not known, and so that there is a long, long way to go. But in the very concrete cases of participating or non-participating, one just has to wait very carefully what will bring anything good, what will not. 
If you are talking about like canceling people like Mr. Gergiev, uh, which is like probably the most well-known case, this is a very particular case. One has to understand that Mr. Gergiev does not represent Russian music in the first place. He might be accidentally a good musician, but this is not his main role. So he is actually he is a member of a very close political circle of Mr. Putin, who was like very outspoken in defending and um, supporting him even when he was not forced to. So, but that's but that is an extreme case. But all the others, I don't know. Maybe you disagree with me. But um, but there are others that I don't know. I, I would say they should be treated individually and without much you know, noise about it. It's not about, I, I don't like, you know, uh, I also I don't feel that I'm sometimes being asked to uh, kind of say something uh, in defense of Russian culture. I don't think that Tolstoy or Chekhov actually requires my defense. I, I don't think so. I think they will survive, you know, I kind of, I'm kind of sure about it. Uh, there is no, there is not my role. Uh, but there are cases that might be, so there is a, it's a sensitive situation, which I might understand. And, uh, and I agree, actually, that uh, Ukrainian culture is not... I, I don't know if I agree about that it was silenced uh, by Soviet Union. It's the, situation, the story is more complex than that, because it was like the phantasm of modernization, where all national, actually everything national was pushed into the sphere of exotic and medieval, including the Russian national kind of so it was about more about this modern culture but it's a very complex story let's not talk about it but in general even the contemporary ukrainian artistic production is it's true that it's not well known enough so when i was um, working on this exhibition and looking at many like what is interesting for me videos and uh, films short films by ukrainian filmmakers and artists they are excellent and they are excellent not just artistically but also in terms of reflection of what was going on in donbass let's say You're and this refraining. is a very complex story and unfortunately russians did not do anything like that or at least i'm not aware of that although documentary theater Indeed, we talked about it, started, started in Moscow, but stopped. Like many things, like many initiatives were stopped, and I'm afraid that many of them might just not continue, because it will be impossible. Thank you, Ms. Degel. Um, Mr. Schmidt, what do you think about boycotting or cancelling um, Russian-born or Russian artists? Do you check on the backgrounds of artists you cooperate with? Uh, I'm, I'm checking not the backgrounds of the artists, I'm checking the art they're producing. And uh, boycott is, as I can agree as well, is a very bad thing. Um, my uh, mailbox is full filled of letters from Ukrainian friends and artists. They are asking me for boycotting, and I'm answering in every, in every sense very clear. That is not my aim to work. I wanted to um, uh, uh, point a very important thing uh, Katya uh, touched, and I can just give you a very warm advice to take a book in your hands. It's written by Boris Groys. And the title of this book is The Invention of Russia. And you have a very, very beautiful collection on essays. They will tell you all these very difficult relationship between how Russia was created, is working against the West by taking things from the West, and how difficult it is to Uh, uh, um, sort out this question of Soviet Union where you have Lithuania, uh, Estonia, Ukraine and Belarus in one uh, state and in the other hand side historically you have uh, the so-called Russian Mir, the world of Russia which was always the closer connection between Belarus, Russia and Ukraine. This is a very difficult and very complicated history which does not uh, started in 1990 because the independence or the aim to be independent of Ukraine and culture and the creation of a nation is a century lasting process which was always stopped and blocked and destroyed and this is not only Russia who played a role in this it's the Habsburg Empire as well and the uh, Prussian Empire as well they stopped and they refigured European po politics centuries for a long time and the modern Ukraine is a is is a 
is a very little territory from the historic Ukraine because the after war was a cut off from Poland and was put to Ukraine. So the Ukrainians running through a very difficult and very difficile process of national understanding, which is another thing than an artistic and aesthetically coming out from this. Thank you for this elaboration. I would Sorry, give the it last. <laughs> it's a complex history. That's true, probably. Um, Anastasia Kosudi, the last words to you. Um, many Ukrainians say, no, there can't be any contact, n uh, not dialogue or anything between Ukrainians and Russians at the moment. What's your position on this question of um, cancelling or yeah, talking or not talking? Yeah, I remember that I was in Vienna two days ago. Uh, we made this one of the readings for the project uh, called About War from Krieg. Um, and we were like reading, they were, we always make these readings bilingual in German and in Ukrainian. And so we were reading texts and then we had a break, we had a coffee. And then suddenly uh, a German, uh, he was, I think he was from Germany, uh, actor, he started reading in Ukrainian quite well, I mean, with the accent, but he, he could understand really. And uh, I was like, well, how, how can you understand it? And he was like, well, yeah, I studied Russian in my school for five years. Um, and uh, this is something that I uh, very often get uh, because of different reasons, because of the education in East Germany, because of Waldorf schools and other stuff. And I'm just, every time I hear about that, I think how well actually Russia colonizes every country it can reach to, and not just colonizes in a political way, but also by its culture. And this is what we are witnessing now when, when, uh, when the, uh, Russia brought full-scale war to Ukraine, when missiles are falling and killing people. Still in Europe, uh, people think it's okay uh, to listen to Russian art, it's okay. Uh, not just us, just make, for example, a discussion just with Ukrainians about Ukraine, but, uh, for example, bring Russians to that because it will make, make the taste uh, probably brighter of that discussion. And, uh, yeah, my personal opinion uh, that uh, no Ukrainian wants to do anything with Russians for a very long time right now, me included. And I think it can only change after Russia will lose this war and Russian state will be, I don't know, changed somehow. We do not know how. Before that, there, there cannot be any conversation about that. We just leave it at that. We could talk about the topic another hour. Um, I'll have a look at the audience. Um, are there any questions you would like to pose to the panel? Otherwise, I'd say thank you very much, Anastasia Kosudi, Ekaterina Degot, and Stefan Schmidtke. And we'll just give to the next panel without a break. You have to stay here for a while, but it's very interesting because we have two directors, Anne Lenk and Herbert Fritsch, who will be talking with Esther Slevogt about working in these times. Thank you a lot. <laughs>